from Los Angeles, California, the entertainment capital of the world. It's the 80s Movie Podcast. I'm your host, Edward Havens. Thank you for listening today. On this episode, we are continuing our mini-series on the movies released by Miramax Films in the 1980s, concentrating on their releases from 1987, the year Miramax would begin its climb towards the top of the independent distribution mountain. The first film Miramax would release in 1987 was Lizzie Borden's Working Girls, and yes, Lizzie Borden is her birth name. Sort of. Her name was originally Linda Elizabeth Borden, and at the age of 11, when she learned about the infamous accused double murderer, she told her parents she only wanted to be addressed as Lizzie. At the age of 18, after graduating high school and heading off to the private women's liberal arts college Wellesley, she would legally change her name to Lizzie Borden. After graduating with a fine arts degree, Borden would move to New York City, where she held a variety of jobs, including being both a painter and an art critic for the influential Art Forum magazine, until she attended a retrospective of Jean-Luc Godard movies, where she was inspired to become a filmmaker herself. Her first film, shot in 1974, was a documentary regrouping about four female artists who were part of a collective that incorporated avant-garde techniques borrowed from performance art as the collective slowly breaks apart. One of the four artists was a 23-year-old painter who would later make film history herself as the first female director to win the Academy Award for Best Director, Catherine Bigelow. But recruiting didn't get much attention when it was released in 1976, and it would take Borden five years to make her first dramatic narrative, Born in Flames, another movie which would also feature Miss Bigelow in a supporting role. Borden would not only write, produce, and direct this film about two different group of feminists who operate pirate radio stations in New York City, which ends with the bombing of the broadcast antenna on top of the World Trade Center, she would also edit the film and act as one of the cinematographers. The film would become one of the first instances of Afrofuturism in film and would become a cultural touchstone in 2016, when a restored print of the film screened around the world to great critical acclaim and would tie for 243rd place in the 2022 sight and sound poll of the greatest films ever made. Other films that it tied with include Preston Sturges's Sullivan's Travels, Woody Allen's Annie Hall, David Cronenberg's Videodrome, and Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. Yes, it's that good, and would have cost only $30,000 to produce. But while Born in Flames wasn't recognized as revolutionary in 1983, it would help her raise $300,000 for her next movie, about the lives of sex workers in New York City. The idea would come to her while working on Born in Flames as she became intrigued about prostitution after meeting some well-educated women on the film who worked a few shifts a week at a brothel to earn extra money or to pay for their education. Like many, Borden's perception of prostitution were women who worked the streets, when in truth streetwalkers only counted for about 15% of business. During the writing of the script, she began visiting brothels in New York City and learned about the rituals involved in the business of selling sex, especially intrigued how many of the sex workers looked out for each other mentally, physically, and hygienically. Along with Sandra Kay, who would play one of the ladies of the night in the film, Borden would work up a script that didn't glamorize or grossly exaggerate the sex industry, avoiding such storytelling tropes as the hooker with a heart of gold, or girls forced into prostitution due to extraordinary circumstances. Most of the ladies playing prostitutes were played by unknown actresses working off-Broadway, while the Johns were non-actors recruited through word of mouth between Borden's friends and the occasional ad in one of the city's sex magazines. Production on Working Girl would begin in March of 1985, with many of the sets being built in Borden's loft in Manhattan, with movable walls to accommodate whatever needed to be shot on any given day. While $300,000 would be ten times what she had on Born in Flames, Borden would stretch her budget to the max by still shooting on 16mm, in the hopes that the footage would look good enough should the finished film be purchased by a distributor, and blown up to 35mm for theatrical exhibition. After a month of shooting, which involved copious amounts of both male and female nudity, Borden would spend six months editing her film. By early 1986, she had a 91-minute cut ready to go, and she and her producer would submit the film to play at that year's Cannes Film Festival. While the film would not be selected to compete for the coveted Palme d'Or, it would be selected for the director's Fortnite, a parallel program that would also include Spike Lee's She's Gotta Have It, Alex Cox's Sid and Nancy, Denny Arcand's The Decline of the American Empire, and Chantelle Ackerman's Golden 80s. 
The film would get into some trouble when it was invited to screen at the Toronto Film Festival a few months later. The movie would have to be approved by the Ontario Film and Video Review Board before being allowed to show at the festival. However, the board would not approve the film without two cuts, including one scene which depicted the quote-unquote graphic manipulation of a man's genitalia by a woman. The festival, which had a long-standing policy of not showing any movie that had been cut for censorship, would appeal the decision on behalf of the filmmakers. The review board denied the appeal, and the festival left the decision of whether to cut the two offending scenes on Borden. Of all the things I've researched about the film, one of the few things I could not find was whether or not Borden made the trims, but the film would play at the festival as scheduled. After Toronto, Borden would field some offers from some of the smaller art house distributors, but none of the bigger independents or studio-affiliated classics divisions. For many, it was too sexual to be a straight art house film, while it wasn't graphic enough to be porn. The one person who did seem to best understand what Borden was going for was, no surprise in hindsight, Harvey Weinstein. Miramax would pick the film up for distribution in late 1986 and planned a February 1987 release. What might be surprising to most who know about Harvey Weinstein, who would pick up the derisive nickname Harvey Scissorhands in a few years for his constant meddling in already completed films, actually suggested Borden add back in a few minutes of footage to balance out the sex with some lighter non-sex scenes. She would, along with making some last-minute dialogue changes, before the film opened on February 5th. Not in New York City or Los Angeles, the traditional launching pad for art house films, but at the Opera Plaza Cinema in San Francisco, where the film would do a decent $8,000 in its first three days. Three weeks after opening at the Opera Plaza, Miramax would open the film at the 57th Street Playhouse in Midtown Manhattan, buoyed by some amazing reviews from the likes of Siskel and Ebert, Vincent Canby of the New York Times, and Jay Hoberman of the Village Voice. Working Girls would gross an astounding $42,000 during its opening weekend there. Two weeks later, it would open in Los Angeles at the Samuel Goldwyn Westside Pavilion Cinemas, where it would bring in $17,000 its first weekend. It would continue to perform well in its major market exclusive runs. An ad in the April 8, 1987 issue of Variety shows new house records of $13,492 in its first week at the Ellis Cinema in Atlanta. $140,000 $140,000 after five weeks in New York. $40,000 after three weeks at the Nickelodeon in Boston. $30,000 after three weeks at the Fine Arts in Chicago. $10,000 in its first week at the Guild in San Diego. And $11,000 in just three days at the TLA in Philly. Now, there's different numbers floating around about how much Working Girls made during its total theatrical run. Box Office Mojo says $1.77 million, which is really good for a low-budget independent film with no stars and featuring a subject still taboo to many Americans today, let alone 37 years ago. But a late June 1987 issue of Billboard magazine about some of the early film successes of the years puts the gross for Working Girls at $3 million. If you want to check out Working Girls, the Criterion Collection put out an exceptional DVD and Blu-ray release of it in 2021, which includes a brand new 4K transfer of the film and a commentary track featuring Borden, cinematographer Judy Arola, and actress Amanda Goodwin, amongst many bonus features. Highly recommended. I've already spoken some about their next film, Ghost Fever, on our episode last year about the fake movie director Alan Smithy and all of his bad movies. For those who haven't listened to that episode yet and are unaware of who Alan Smithy wasn't, Smithy was a pseudonym created by the Directors Guild in the late 1960s who could be assigned the directing credit of a movie whose real director felt the final cut of the film did not represent his or her vision. By the time Ghost Fever came around in 1987, it would be the 12th movie to be credited to Alan Smithy. If you have listened to that episode, you can go ahead and skip forward a couple minutes, but be forewarned, I am going to be offering up a different elaboration on the film than I did on that episode. And away we go. Those of us born in the 1960s and before remember a show called All in the Family, and we remember Archie Bunker's neighbors, George and Louise Jefferson, who were eventually spun off onto their own hit series, The Jeffersons. Sherman Hemsley played George Jefferson on All in the Family and The Jeffersons for 12 years, but despite the show being a hit for a number of years, placing as high as number three during the 1981-1982 television season, 
Roles for Hemsley and his co-star Isabel Sanford outside of the show were few and far between. During the 11 seasons the Jeffersons ran on television from 1975 to 1985, Sherman Hemsley would only make one movie, 1979's Love at First Bite, where he played a small role as a reverend. He appears on the poster, but his name is not listed amongst the other actors on the poster. So when the producers of the then-titled Benny in Beaufort approached Hemsley in the spring of 1984 to play one of the title roles, he was more than happy to accept. The Jeffersons was about to start its summer hiatus, and here was the chance to not only make a movie, but to be the number one actor listed on the call sheet. He might not ever get that chance again. The film, by now titled Benny and Buford Meet the Bigoted Ghost, would shoot in Mexico City at the Estudios America in the summer of 1984, before Hemsley was due back in Los Angeles to shoot the 11th and what would be the final season of his show. But it would not be a normal shoot. In fact, there would be two different versions of the movies shot back to back. One in English would be directed by Lee Madden, who would hinge his comedy on the bumbling antics of its black police officer, Buford, and his Hispanic partner, Benny. The other version would be shot in Spanish by Mexican director Miguel Rico, where the comedy would satirize class and social differences rather than racial differences. Hemsley would speak his line in English and would be dubbed by a Spanish-speaking actor in post-production. Luis Avalos, best known as Dr. Dulots on the PBS children's show The Electric Company, would play Benny. The only other name in the cast was boxing legend Smokin' Joe Frazier, who was making his proper acting debut in the film as, not too surprisingly, a boxer. The film would have a four-week shooting schedule, and Hemsley was back at work on the Jeffersons on time. Madden would get the film edited together rather quick, and the producers would have a screening for potential distributors in early October. That screening did not go well. Madden would be fired from the production, the script rewritten, and a new director named Herbert Strock would be hired to shoot more footage once Hemsley was done with his commitments to the Jeffersons in the spring of 1985. This is when Madden contacted the Director's Guild to request the Smithy pseudonym. But since the film was still in production, the DGA could not issue a judgment and the, until the producers provided the Guild with a completed copy of the film. That would happen in late in fall of 1985, and Madden was able to successfully show that he had directed a majority of the completed film, but it did not represent his vision. The film was not good, but Miramax still needed product to fill their distribution pipeline. They announced in mid-March of 1987 that they had acquired the film for distribution and that the film would be opening in Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, Miami, Nashville, St. Louis, and Tampa, St. Peterburg, Florida the following week. Miramax did not release how many theaters the film was playing in in those markets, and the only market variety did track of those that week was St. Louis, where the film did $7,000 from the four theaters they were tracking. Best as I can tell from limited newspaper archives of the day, Ghost Fever played on nine screens in Atlanta, four in Dallas-Fort Worth, 25 in Miami, and 12 in Sam Tampa St. Pete on top of the four I can find in St. Louis. By the following week, it appears that every theater that was playing Ghost Fever had dropped it. The film would not open in any other market until it opened on 16 screens in the greater Los Angeles metro region on September 11th. No theaters in Hollywood, no theaters in Westwood, no theaters in Beverly Hills or Santa Monica or, or any major theater around, outside of the Palace Theater downtown, a once a stately theater that had fallen into disrepair over the previous three decades. And once again, Miramax did not release grosses for the run, and none of the theaters playing the film were being tracked by Variety that week, and all the playdates were gone after one week. Today, you can find two slightly different copies of the film on a very popular video-sharing website, one the theatrical cut, the other, the home video cut. The home video cut is preceded by a quick history of the film, including a tidbit that Hemsley bankrolled $3 million of the production himself, and that the film's failure almost made him bankrupt. I could not find any source to verify this, but there is possibly specious evidence to back up this claim. The producers of the film were able to make back the budget selling the film to home video companies and cable movie channels around the world and Helmsley would sue them in December 1987 for $3 million, claiming he was owed this amount from the profits and interest. It would take nine years to work its way through the court system, 
but a jury in March 1996 would award Hemsley $2.8 million. The producers appealed, and an appellate court would uphold the verdict in April of 1998. One of the biggest indie film success stories of 1987 was Patricia Rosema's I've Heard the Mermaid Singing. In the early 1980s, Rosema was working as an assistant producer on a Canadian broadcast corporation current affairs television show called The Journal. Although she enjoyed her work, she, like many of us, wanted to be a filmmaker. While working on The Journal, she started to write screenplays while taking a class at a Toronto Polytechnic Institute on 16mm film production. Now, one of the nicer things about the Canadian film industry is that there's a number of government-funded arts councils that help young, independent Canadian filmmakers get their low-budget films financed. But Rosema was having trouble getting her earliest ideas funded. Finally, in 1984, she was able to secure funding for Passion, a short film she had written about a documentary filmmaker who writes an extremely intimate letter to an unknown lover. Linda Griffiths, the star of John Sayles' 1983 film Leanna plays the filmmaker, and Passion would go on to be nominated for a Gold Hugo for Best Short Film at the 1985 Chicago Film Festival. However, a negative review of the short film in the Globe and Mail, often called Canada's newspaper of record, would anger Rosemma, and she would use that anger to write a new script, Polly, which would be a polemic against the Toronto elitist high art milieu and its merciless negative judgments towards newer artists. Polly, the lead character and narrator of the film, lives alone, has no friends, rides her bike around Toronto to take photographs of whatever strikes her fancy, and regularly indulges herself in whimsical fantasies. An employee for a temporary secretarial agency, Polly gets placed in a private art gallery. The gallery owner is having an off-again, on-again relationship with one of her clients, a painter who has misgivings that she is too young for the gallery owner, and the owner too old for her. Inspired by the young painter, Polly anonymously submits some of her photographs to the gallery in the hopes of getting featured, but becomes depressed when the gallery owner, who does not know who took the photos, dismisses them in front of Polly, calling them simple-minded. Polly quits the gallery and retreats to her apartment. When the painter sees the photographs, she presents herself as the photographer of them, and she and the gallery owner start to pass them off as the younger artist's work, even after the gallery owner learns that they are not of the painter's work. When Polly finds out about the fraud, she confronts the gallery owner, eventually throwing a cup of tea at the owner. Soon thereafter, the gallery owner and the painter go back to check up on Polly at her flat, where they discover more photos of undeniable beauty, and the story ends with the three women in one of Polly's fantasies. Rosemma would work on the screenplay for Polly while she was working as a third assistant director on David Cronenberg's The Fly. During the writing process, which took about a year, Rosemma would change the title from Polly, Polly's Progress, to Polly's Interior Mind. When she would submit the script in June of 1986 to the various Canadian arts foundations for funding, it would be sent out with yet another new title, Oh, The Things I've Seen. The first agency to come aboard the film was the Ontario Film Development Corporation, and soon thereafter, the National Film Board of Canada, the Ontario Arts Council, and the Canada Council would also join the funding operation. But the one council they desperately needed to fund the gap was Telefilm Canada, the Canadian government's principal instrument for supporting Canada's audiovisual industry. Telefilm Canada at the time had a reputation for being Philosophically adverse to low-budget, auteur-driven films, a point driven home directly by the administrator of the group at the time, who reportedly stomped out of a meeting concerning the making of this very film, reportedly declaring that telefilms should not be financing these types of minimalistic student films. Telefilm would reverse course when Rosemma and her producer, Alexander Raff, agreed to bring on Don Haig, often called the godfather of Canadian cinema, as an executive producer. Side note, several months after this film completed shooting, Haig would win an Academy Award for producing a documentary about the musician Artie Shaw. Once they had their $350,000 budget, Rosemma and Raff got to work on pre-production, and money was tight on such an ambitious first feature. They only had $500 to help their casting agent identify potential actors for the film, although most of the cast would come from Rosemma's friendships with them. 
They would cast 30-year-old Sheila McCarthy, a first-time film actress with only one television credit to her name, as Polly. Shooting would begin in Toronto on September 24, 1986 and would go on for four weeks, shooting completely in 16mm because they could not afford to shoot on 35. Once filming was completed, the National Film Board in Canada allowed Rosemma use of their editing studio for free. And when Rosemma struggled with editing the film, the film board offered to pay for the consulting services of Ron Sanders, who had edited five of David Cronenberg's movies, including Scanners, Videodrome, and The Fly, which Rosemma gladly accepted. After New Year's 1987, Rosemma had a rough cut of the film ready to show to the various funding agencies. That edit of the film was only 65 minutes long, but it went over very well with the viewers. So much so that the president of Cinephile Films, the Canadian movie distributor who also helped to fund the film, suggested that Rosemma not only add another 15 minutes or so to the film wherever she could, but submit the film to be entered into the director's fortnight program at the Cannes Film Festival. Rosemma still needed to add the requested footage in and finish the sound mix, but she agreed as long as she was able to complete the film by the time the con programmers met in mid-March. She wouldn't quite make herself impose deadline, but the film would get selected for con anyway. But this time she had an absolute deadline. The film had to be completed in time for the festival, which would include needing to make a 35mm blow-up of the 16mm print, and the production just did not have the money. Rosemma and Raff asked Telefilm Canada if they could have $40,000 for the print, but they were turned down. Twice. Someone suggested they speak with the foreign sales agent who acquired the rights to sell the film at Con. The sales agent not only agreed to fund the cost from sales of the film to the various territories that would be returned to the various arts councils, but he would create a press kit, translate the English language script into French, make sure the print showing at Con would have French subtitles, and create the key art for the posters and other ads. Rosemma would actually help to create the key art, a picture of Sheila McCarthy's head floating over a body of water, an image that approximately 80% of all buyers would use for their own posters and ads around the world. By the time the film premiered in Cannes on May 10, 1987, Rosemma had changed the title once again to I've Heard the Mermaids Singing. The title will be taken from a line in the T.S. Eliot poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which she felt best represented the film. But whatever it was titled, the 2,000 people inside the theater for its first screening were mesmerized and gave the film a six-minute standing ovation. The festival quickly added four more screenings of the film, all of which sold out. While a number of territories around the world had purchased the film before the premiere, the filmmakers bet big on themselves by waiting until after the world premiere to entertain offers from American distributors. Following the premiere, a number of companies made offers for the film. Miramax would be the highest at $100,000, but the filmmakers said no. They kept the bidding going until they got Miramax up to $350,000, the full budget of the film. And by the time the festival was done, the sales agent had booked more than $1.1 million worth of sales. The film had earned back more than triple its cost before it ever opened on a single commercial screen. Oh, and it also won Rosemma the Prix de la Jeunesse, the prize of the youth from the director's fortnight judges. Miramax would schedule I've Heard the Mermaid Singing to open at the 68th Street Playhouse in New York City on September 11th, after screening at the Toronto Film Festival, then called the Festival of Festivals the night before, and at the Telluride Film Festival the previous week. Miramax was so keen on the potential success of the film that they would buy their first ever full page newspaper ad in the Sunday, September 6th New York Times Arts and Leisure section, which cost them $25,000. The critical and audience reactions in Toronto and Telluride matched the enthusiasm on the Croset, which would translate to big box office its opening weekend. $40,000, the best single screen gross in all Manhattan. While it would lose that crown to my life as a dog the following week, its 32,000 second weekend gross was still one of the best in the city. After three weekends in New York City, the film would already have grossed $100,000. That weekend, the film would also open at the Samuel Goldwyn West Pavilion Cinemas, where a $9,500 opening weekend gross was considered nice. Good word of mouth kept the grosses respectable for months, and after eight months in theaters, never playing in more than 27 theaters in any given week, 
the film would gross $1.4 million in American theaters. Ironically, the film did not go over as well in Rosemma's home country, where it grossed a little less than half a million Canadian dollars, and didn't even play in the director's hometown due to a lack of theaters that were willing to play a quote-unquote queer movie. But once it was all said and done, I've heard the mermaid's singing would end up with a worldwide gross of more than 10 million Canadian dollars, a nearly 2,500% return on the initial investment. Not only would part of those profits go back to the arts councils that helped fund the film, those profits would help fund the next group of independent Canadian filmmakers. And the film would become one of a growing number of films with LGBTQ lead characters whose success would break down the barriers some exhibitors had about playing non-straight movies. The impact of this film on queer cinema and on Canadian cinema cannot be understated. In 1993, Author Michael Posner spent the first 20 pages of his 250-plus page book, Canadian Dreams, discussing the history of the film, under the subtitle, The Little Film That Did. And in 2014, author Julia Mendelhall wrote a 160-page book just about the movie, with a subtitled, A Queer Film Classic. You can find both copies of the books on a popular web archive website if you want to learn more. Amazingly, for a company that would regularly take up 14 months between releases, Merrimax would end 1987 with allegedly not one, not two, but three new titles in just the last six weeks of the year. But one that I can definitely place in theater. And here's where you can't just always trust the IMDb or Wikipedia by themselves. The first alleged release of the three according to both sources, Writers on the Storm, a wacky comedy featuring Dennis Hopper and Michael J. Pollard, which supposedly opened in theaters on November 13th. Except it didn't. It did open in New York City on May 7th, 1998, and in Los Angeles the following Friday. But we'll talk more about that movie on our next episode. The second film of the alleged trifecta was Crazy Moon, a romantic comedy-slash-drama from Canada that featured Kiefer Settle and his Brooks, a young man who finds love with Anne, a deaf girl working at a clothing store where Brooks and his brother are trying to steal a mannequin. Like I've Heard the Mermaid Singing, Crazy Moon would benefit from the support of several Canadian arts foundations, including Telefilm Canada and the National Film Board of Canada. In an unusual move, Merrimax would release Crazy Moon on 18 screens in Los Angeles on December 11th as part of an Oscar-qualifying run. I say unusual because although in the 1980s a movie that wanted to qualify for awards consideration had to play in at least one commercial movie theater in Los Angeles for seven consecutive days before the end of the year. Most distributors did just that. One movie theater. They normally didn't do 18 screens, including cities like Long Beach, Irvine, and Upland. It would, however, definitely be a one-week run. Despite a number of decent reviews, Los Angeles audiences were too busy doing plenty of other things to see Crazy Moon. Miramax once again didn't report grosses, but six of the 18 theaters playing the film were tracked by Variety that week, and the combined gross of those six theaters was $2,500. It would not get any awards and nominations. It would never open in another movie theater. The third film, allegedly released by Miramax during the 1987 holiday season, The Magic Snowman, has a reported theatrical release date of December 22, 1987, according to the IMDb, which is also the date listed on the Wikipedia page for the list of movies Miramax released in the 1980s. I suspect this is a direct-to-video release for several reasons, the two most important ones being that December 22nd was a Tuesday. Back in the 1980s, most home video titles came out on Tuesdays. And I cannot find a single play date anywhere in the country around this date, even in the Weinstein's hometown of Buffalo. In fact, the only mention of the words Magic Snowman together that I can find for all of 1987 is a live performance of a show called The Magic Snowman in Peterborough, England in November of 1987. So, now here we are eight years into the history of Miramax, and they've started to pick up some steam. Granted, Working Girls and I've Heard the Mermaid Singing wasn't going to get the company a major line of credit to start making films of their own, but it would help them with the visibility amongst the independent and global film communities that these guys can open your films in America. Thank you for joining us. We'll talk again soon when we continue with the story of Miramax Films, this time from 1988. 
Remember to visit this episode's page on our website, the80smoviepodcast.com, for extra materials about the movies we've covered on this episode. The 80s Movie Podcast has been researched, written, narrated, and edited by Edward Havens for idiosyncratic entertainment. Thank you again. Good night. (laughs) 